camera and on stage. Uh, also, kind of talking about how you can, you know, get some good pictures of your costume on your part, and you know how you can uh, just present yourself well at a convention that contest. Yeah. So you made your costume, and you get into a convention, and let's. And I'm sure for a lot of you, it's it's kind of like still a new thing. Maybe for some of you, you've been making a costume, but you're not sure how to get into character. Well, um, there's also the fact that there's people there, you know, and it's a nervous factor. And then someone <laughs> stops you for a picture, yeah. and you're just like, you're in a headline. <laughs> oh no! And you sometimes look at the picture, and you're just kind of like, um, and maybe yeah. they, I don't know, and you just like, so, oh no. What you want to do is have a few poses in mind that you practiced ahead of time. Always put your, if you can. I know some people will put their costume on like for the first time completed at the convention. I've done it before. Even without the costume, you can still practice poses before the costume is completed. It's just when you're making a cosplay, um, if you're interested in being in character, then what you want to do is know the character and know how, the, how you can fit the character. Um, We'll use ourselves as an example. Uh, Zach is a pretty cheery guy, you know. He's you know, he's always smiling. He's always, you know. So I just kind of keep it easy, put a smile on, poses. I've got a big ass sword, so I use that to my advantage. I'll, it takes a bit of practice, so like it helps if you have someone with who has a camera who can take pictures of you ahead of time, so that you know what it looks like through the lens, because that's the toughest part is you see someone with a camera, you're not sure how it looks from their side. And sometimes you have to just kind of guess, because not everyone's going to care. They just want a picture. But say that you want it to look cool, uh, and you can practice, like, pretend they got the camera. You know? Have someone with, oh my god. Um, have someone with a camera who can take a picture and just, like, guide you. And when they're taking a picture, uh, try to note how how they look from your perspective, so that you'll know that how you look from their perspective. Does that make sense? Any at all? Okay. Okay. Practice in front of a mirror. Go, yeah. You practice know, in front of a mirror. Practice in front of a mirror because you may think a pose looks really cool because that's exactly what the character does. But depending on what angle you're presenting it in front of the camera, it could look really derpy. Like yeah. whether it be often. I'm not talking of, derpy the pony. I mean, oftentimes I kind of just pull my gun at the camera, or I have a sword, and I point the sword at the camera. Because of like the foreshortening of that shape, it looks kind of funny in a picture. Usually when photographers that know what they're doing are taking pictures of a costume, like with a sword or some prop like that, we'll have you push it off to the side. So you might actually like try that in yeah. the mirror and see how that looks, and be like, oh, okay, I see what they're doing there, you know? Yeah, there's some basic tactics to keep in mind, and we'll go over them now. Basically, like, again, foreshortening is a weird thing. Like, it looks weird from this angle, doesn't it? But if you tilt it just a little bit, it still looks cool, but you get more of the detail on the sword or whatever it is, the gun. It's the same thing with the smaller ones of your gun. If, if you angle it, uh, you can even cheat it so, like, you're not looking at the camera. Actually, a lot of cool shots don't want to have you looking at the camera because then it's more like you're in, like, you're the taking it into the moment. Like, they're not focusing on you, but they're focusing on whatever it is. I'm attacking some monster over here. So I'm like, you know, kind of a serious pose. And, you know, it, it kind of captures the essence of, of the situation, basically. Now, even if you don't have a prop, which props make su it's super easy to, you know, kind of do poses of different varieties for camera. But if you're doing a character that doesn't have any sort of prop whatsoever, and you want to still look cool for the camera, do lots and lots of research on your character to figure out how they walk, how they present themselves when they're just standing still. Um, video games is, you know, like Roxas, I know was a good example. You have yeah, like a standard pose there. Like their, you know. What's, what are their signature pose? That, that's the biggest thing to consider is what do you remember the character doing the most? Like if there's like a key moment, like a, I don't know, what, like say with Zach, there's like this key moment where he's just kind of concentrating, he's in thought, and he, he puts his sword to his face. And that's like a really key element of the, of the game. He does that a few times, and it's like he's reminiscing on things, you know? Or say like his standard attack pose, where he's got his legs spread out and the sword kind of angled forward. That's that's like a key attack pose. Um, and, if you or, don't, I was going to say though, if you don't have 
props, even if the carriage doesn't necessarily do it, sometimes they just kind of have a more relaxed arm to the side. But um, when you're when you're standing in front of camera, you don't normally want to just stand straight in front so you're holding like you know the poncho. You kind of want to do a three quarters. Right. A three quarters is a very good attractive. Um, Kind of artistic, you know, in a way. It, it's, it seems more natural for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could do, uh, you know, if you're, you know, doing a girly character, like a hand on hip, or you know, kind of shift your weight or something. For a guy, um, and I talk about guys, this in the crossplay panel, but guys, put the shoulders back, puff the chest out. Yeah. Maybe yeah. like hands on your, like their, your hips, not your hands on the hip. hips. Hands on the hips. A little um, bit. Yeah. Kind of like you can also just kind of take an artistic license on how your character is personality-wise and how you would do it. I was like, if you're like I was, you know, thinking of ponies right now, Fluttershy, you might do like a cute little shy pose or something. Whereas Pinkie Pie is like in your face, like smiling all over the place. You know, it's something real cute. You know. Yeah. There's a lot Very of energetic. Can... Have have that excitement in your eyes. You know, it's just like bulging out. It's like I want to be your friend. <laughs> Maybe not too creepy. But, you know, <laughs> that is kind of creepy, by though, in a way. <laughs> but um, where, like, say Alice over here, she's like creepy, right? She, I haven't played the game, so I'm just guessing Big here. Hammers. You got a you bloody sword. You're just kind of like pulling, them, you know, get get into the character, like get into the elements that you remember from the game, and pull that out, basically. <clears throat> you got any other characters here that that you want? Your Black Star. Yeah. Um. Just how if like. Let's say your character has like a higher pitched voice than you like. What what would you do to like go about that? Because like I made the joke with my friends sometimes like um, when I'm cosplaying as Blackstar, I'll say like I'm Blackstar going through puberty. Yeah, I actually think that's hilarious because like you're not always gonna have that option. I can't really hit some of the high notes I, either. I, yeah, because like I can't do like a Naruto like yeah. Uh, kind of Believe voice. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not like really funny or anything. No, but sometimes um, you don't have to talk. You know, no one's asking you to talk if they're yeah, expecting you to if, do that. But. If it's a matter of being in character, do it the, to the best of your ability. Yeah, you know, make your make it your own. Yeah, that's, that's a big part because, like, you know, there are cosplayers who, who cosplay characters who don't necessarily look like them. Yeah, like you'll you'll have black Naruto's. You'll you'll have heavier weight cosplayers. It's, it doesn't matter. What what you need to understand is that you are making the character your own. Ah, so play to your advantages, or what you feel are your advantages. You know, right? It's, you know, even regardless of your, of your, you know, your weight or your complexion, whether you're, whether you're a, a guy or a girl crossplay, <laughs> whether you're tall or short, however old you are, there are no restrictions as unless you give yourself restrictions. Basically, mm -hmm. it is what you make of it. Because like I know a lot of people, since there aren't a whole lot of tan people in anime. Um, like I've, I've basically commonly cosplayed as Brock from Pokemon, or I've gone. Yeah, the I'm sure you leash. pulled them off great, but never feel like those are your only restrictions. Yeah, if I mean, you want to cosplay the so whitest pale like a or something, do it. We just, you know? I was gonna say like you know, honestly, cosplayers that really stand out to me sometimes aren't just the ones that are just spot on accurate, or you know, it's, it's how they sometimes it's just how they present themselves, exactly. how they act in character. Yeah. And act as that character, and you're just like, that's hilarious, or oh wow, that's really cool. We had a like a character from a Team Fortress game come up and do a, kind of a judging, and, or we did craftsmanship judging. He was talking in the accent the whole time, ah. and it was hilarious. Yeah, it was amazing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and there's just small things that you can consider, like uh, if you can pull off a certain accent, uh, if if you say certain catchphrases that they like to use a lot. Um, it's just small things that people will catch, and they'll be like. Wait a minute, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah. those, that's, those are like the icing on the cake, basically. Oh, which happens to be a lie. Yeah, so, I mean, there's that. Um, I imagine some of you are here because maybe you get nervous in front of people. Um, I think the biggest thing for that is you have to just take a deep breath and realize everyone here is a geek just like me. And, you know, we're... Just remember, you know... You know, we're all the good. same kinds of interests, you know? Yeah. There shouldn't be this barrier. It's it's really a community thing, and everyone comes to these conventions because they want to meet other people who have the same interests as them. So I mean, you should. It, it's I mean, it takes some practice still. We still get the jitters sometimes. We oh yeah, I years. am not a performance person. You know, it's and every time my <laughs> friends and I do a skit or even just a walk around, I get butterflies. You get the butterflies, but you just gotta take a deep breath. Remember, 
They are all the same kind of people, you know, it's the same crap. It's not like we're doing this in front of a whole bunch of rednecks who think we're idiots. <laughs> you know? It's it's a whole bunch of cos costume you know, like cosplayers and anime people, video gamers. They all love this stuff. And they're gonna love you regardless. Um, now, so, when it comes to going on stage, though, and you're doing like a walk-on or a skip for the first time, now walk-ons, usually, it's kind of standard now that they have a big enough stage that you can do like three poses for the walk-on. And that's, three, two or three is a good number. And usually yeah. what they'll do is they'll have an entry and an exit, whether it's separate or together. Um, I'm going to kind of do a demonstration, I guess. Right. Um, so, say like this is the entry to the stage. And that's the exit. Now say, um, like we do, uh, usually... Sometimes they'll have tape marking up, uh, key spots that you do, but typically you, you'll have a pose in the left area, kind of one towards the middle, and then one towards the right. And, but that's not set in stone. Something, though, that I see all the time, especially with people who've never done a walk-on before, is that they get really nervous and they kind of rush through it before you get a good chance to look at their costume. Yeah, if, you, if, if nothing else, if you're going to a walk-on and you can't really think of any poses, at least take the time to stop and just kind of show off the costume. Because people want to see it. They want to take pictures of you. They want to clap. You know, they, they want to cheer for you. So, because you're up on stage, you're taking the time to show off your stuff. So, if you're doing like a craftsmanship and you want people to admire all parts of your costume, including like the back of it, do you, like might, a slow spin. you might do a spin or you might have a pose that shows off the back if there's, if there's something really impressive on the costume that you Yeah, want to I mean, see. like, look at ours. We've, we've got these cool designs on the back. We took some time to do this. <laughs> nice. Like, who's to say I can't just walk up and just kind of turn around and be like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Showing off the back set. I always, uh, props are always fun because you can do cool action poses. Like, I oftentimes do this one where I'm crouching on the ground like this. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, that's not kind of silly. No, I'm just... So you got poses. If you mess up, something falls off, just go with it. Yeah. Okay, you know? Don't panic. My knee pad just fell off of it. Oh, snap. But I still will go with it, and when I leave stage is when I think it up. Just kick it off the stage or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, it happens. Yeah, I had, I had a big O cosplay once and one of the fingers fell off the hands. I didn't even notice. <laughs> and like one of my, one of the other people in my group picked it up. So fine. Yeah. But like, say you got a couple poses. Um, if you can think of poses that lead into each other, that's really cool. Like say I've got this, they start with a standard pose up on stage over here. Then obviously you're further away, but like I, t I could take a swipe and then like turn them back. And that leads into the second pose, basically. Showing off my backside, she still shows off the sword. It looks cool. People like it. And that can go ahead and do something that I would here. But, you know, it's, it's got a, like, good flow to it. And it's really simple. You're, you're basically taking a few steps, and it's easy. <laughs> Sometimes it's nice to kind of consider what order you want to do certain poses also to, like, if you want to like have a big surprise in the middle, like or you come on stage, you know, people kind of like, oh, it's this character, I love him, I love him, I love him, and then you do your really cool pose, and they're like, whoa, and then finish off like you could either have, or you could have that last pose like that you do. I, mean, the, I, I think either the the second or third pose should be your best the, pose. Your best pose. Never start off with your best because it it's just kind of anticlimactic. It's like I don't know. <laughs> People are still kind of trying to figure out what character you are on stage and get that recognition. Maybe, or or the, or it just kind of dies down before it's completely over. You know, it's it's like a, if a movie had the most epic stuff right at the beginning and then it's really boring the rest of the time through. Only in, in you know, it's that. So it's like you want to lead up to the grand finale basically, and in three poses that's pretty easy to do. So it's not like a big deal. But it's it's still helpful to have that that final key pose either in the middle or at the very end. And if you do it at the middle, then the ending pose can still be something like your second best. But it's it's still kind of helpful to just kind of finish with something that they'll remember. So we covered some of the essentials and stuff. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Yeah, because we just like to ramble. If, if you don't talk, we're just gonna keep. <laughs> Any questions? No questions. Are we doing good <laughs> so far? Any, like, 
What's up, Black Star? Um, what's the weirdest cosplay um, you guys have done? Like weirdest cosplay? Or like the one you felt the most embarrassed to do? Yoko. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she did a yoga. But I had a badass gun, so that was my, I called out my costume on the actual bikini. We didn't actually walk on for that one, though. And, Not really. And Zach, what about you? <sighs> That's <laughs> tough, honestly. I've, I don't think I've ever done anything that I felt really weird about, because, you know, I, I pick characters that I want to be. So, so like, I, I take into consideration ahead of time. Of course, like, I've been doing it for a while now, so even in the stages of making the costume, I'm already thinking, okay, what am I going to be doing when I'm in the costume? Yeah. And that really helps. That, that is, that's actually a good question, you know, because um, basically you, you want to be thinking about how are you in character if that's what you want to do. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, a lot of times I'll pick characters based on how they compare to me as a person. Um, I'm a pretty outgoing person. I like to talk to people. I can't shut up sometimes. <laughs> so, like, one of my first costumes was a fascist stampede. He's a Woo! crazy... You know, he's a crazy fool. He makes just runs around and screams a lot, and so that was kind of fun as the first costume. He's like a big dork all over the place. And but uh, I've pulled off the serious characters too because it's it's kind of fun to change it up sometimes. But I can still pull it off. You know. Um, I, I mean, know, I sometimes we do things in groups, and like for example, we did like Yu-Gi-Oh GX, and all of those little ah. high school boys. And here's Manly Kyle as Group Yo stuff. <laughs> I was supposed to be a little kid character, <laughs> but it's yeah, so it worked funny. okay. Uh, actually, group, groups can be a really great way to get started with role playing stuff because you can build off of each other and you can practice ahead of time. Um, I mean, you can have stuff practiced at almost like a skit that you just do in front of people um, and not necessarily on stage. And that's a good way to practice and build up towards feeling confidence to do skits and walk-ons together. You know, it's get practice out in the, you know, out in the thick of it. Uh, when a person walks up to you and wants their picture, like, I don't know, if somebody wants our picture together, I'll, I'll just do the kind of big brother thing, just like, <laughs> you know, just, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> just kind of act in character, it's it played up. I'll be a vegetable boy, I'm going to you around. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's really helpful when you have a person there with you because it, you can kind of play off of each other and it makes it easier. But I, I, I am a lot less nervous when I do stuff with groups. I'm, yeah, I'm it, a pretty shy person energy. when I'm by myself. I sometimes it's just I'm just kind of to myself. I don't really get as outgoing and you know it's even I have a hard time sometimes going up to people to ask for a picture or something and you know, if I yeah. have it. And I, I will bring up that don't feel like you're obligated to stay in character all the time because that's what I just, you know, people, people you're a real person. Some people are of it, but they're just rude people. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's situational because you, you have to keep in mind that you never know what a person's been doing all day, what they've been through. They might have just had a bad experience. You know, they might be grumpy. I've been grumpy before in front of people and I feel bad about it afterwards. And like, there's two parts to that. Like, whether you're taking a picture of someone or whether you're posing for someone, like you have to, it, you have to keep an open mind and, and try to realize if they're being snippy as a photographer, maybe that something bad happened to them. They have bad experience with someone else. You shouldn't necessarily judge them, but you know, just pose, be yourself, be a good person, walk on. And if you're in a bad mood, don't feel obligated to to suffer every picture that someone wants. If like if you have to turn down a picture and you have to go somewhere, you have to go somewhere. Or if you're just not in the mood. Most sometimes of the time people that's are pretty understandable. Or you could at least yeah. say to them, costume malfunction or I'm not feeling very well. Yeah, so usually I'm if if you don't feel like just telling them off like I gotta go or I'm in a bad mood, then just lie. <laughs> I'm like take part of your costume off and saying, I I'm sorry, my costume is not functioning well. I mean if it, it's a quick way, it's a quick out, you know, if, because sometimes you do, sometimes you need that. Like, we'll have times where we're, we got to rush to a panel like this one, and people want our picture on the way, and we're like, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to a panel, I'm, I'm hosting the panel, <laughs> you know, like, you understand, right? You follow us to the panel, if you want, you know, <laughs> just kind of talk your way through it. Or if, if we want to go to the room, because we are, like, zonked out, exhausted, take the wig off, take, take the, you know, break the prop now, but, that actually happened to me 
this. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked perfectly because I, by that point I was tired, so I was like, you know what? My store's busted. I'm sorry, guys. I gotta go to my room. <laughs> I didn't break it so that I could go to my room, but it worked out. But, like, just pretend something's off, you know? So if, you, if you're halfway out of your costume, it's a lot easier for them to understand they don't want to take a picture. But that's only if you don't want them to take a picture. If you do, then obviously. Usually, it's like, it's like I don't mind if you. Generally, it's like, it's like I don't mind if you wanted to have my picture. It's just I, I can't right now. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm the best of my character. Yeah. You could you could tell them a place that you'll be later. Like say if there's a photo shoot going on later. They're like, yeah. Actually, if you want me and other characters from the same show, we're gonna be here at this time. You know. Or say there isn't a photo shoot. You could just say I'm gonna be in this area later on. You, if you want to find me then, I'll, I'd be happy to have you take my picture then. Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of different ways to work it out because like sometimes it just doesn't work out with your schedule. But one thing I do like to cover though a little bit also like going along the kind of cosplay etiquette. Cosplay etiquette is a good thing to talk about in this kind of panel. I would say so. Uh, whenever you're, I mean, regardless if you're the cosplayer or the or seeing someone who or, like wants to have a picture with someone who's a cosplayer, like going back, you know, you want to be very considerate if they're in a hurry or they can't stop. Don't. Don't feel offended because you know they probably have a pretty good reason. Um, never. Uh, usually, people with, uh, will have lots of. You'll see lots of really intricate props and wigs. You don't want to ever. I mean, people get better about it, but you know there are people sometimes that get a little too overexcited. It's their first convention. Yeah. They want to come up and want to, you. Yeah. <laughs> might have to like have, have like, to I'm practice I'm how to shield your weapon if that happens yeah. or something. Um, uh, say, like you had a moment you were a Seto Kaiba. Yeah, I had a Seto Kaiba and I had like the wire through the coat and stuff. So I was, wasn't, and I had like other, you somewhat had a dual disc part. Yeah, it's a yeah. Seat. Well, the dual discs were hard to find because like you go on eBay and they're really hard to find. So I was afraid they were going to break it. Like these three girls like circled along with me. I was like, ha! Like, you were in, oh. it's funny because he was like he was kind of in character at yeah. the time and so he was really grumpy. It's like, it's like hey, back off. <laughs> I'll I'll say yeah. yeah. But I mean, you kind of just have to be a bit cautious about that. Figure out a self-defense mechanism without being weird and pushing them away, you know. But when I'm also, I'm just like scary. <laughs> Yeah. And again, that's not really as common these days because a lot of people are more understanding about that fact. Or if nothing else, you see a good costume, you're like more kind of intimidated to, to swamp them necessarily. But either way, um, I don't know. It's be careful. <laughs> So we're doing good so not far. too hard to cover like most of the topics on the cosplay presentation of things. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Even if it's not presentation or performance related? Yeah. Does anybody want a particular example of something that we haven't covered in the past or want more specific? Oh, I guess we could talk about skits. Yeah, we haven't really touched on skits much. Um, I guess has anyone ever been interested in doing a skit or yeah? yeah. People? Um, now, as far as cosplay, have you guys done skits before? Uh, yes, I did a Lucky Star dance as Black Star. Awesome, awesome. Um, when you when you come up with a skit, uh, things are definitely like... take time with it. I we've seen plenty of skits that were very last minute, and while they can be fun, they can also be disastrous. If you're not careful. So if you want your skit to be the best that it can be, start months in advance. You know, take your time, make sure that it is like you've got the ideas down. You've You've got the audio recorded. Um, Usually, a lot of contests now require pre recorded audio, whether it's a music track or, you know, they don't always give you microphones. Yeah, not, not every convention that has microphones that they're willing to hand the down now. Because you never know what's so. uh, What programs do you use to record skits? Um, Audacity. Audacity is, is, is a free, downloadable, it's a free downloadable program. Yeah, if you Google Audacity, you can record until you get that. Um, <laughs> Just look it up on, on Google or whatever, and it's, um, it's really nice. I recommend, I mean, you can get different kinds of microphones. Some people have them built in their computer. There's a special Logitech microphone that's like between $20 and $30. Yeah, it gets really, it's really quality. nice. It's, it's good, good enough for skits anyway. Um, rock band microphones work. Yeah. Uh, I have a 
cheap Logitech microphone that I thought would be pretty good and it wasn't. It was like $8 at Walmart. The, yeah, mean, keep the receipt, test good. it out, see if it's what you're going to want, and if it's not, then we're trying to get something else. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they're really fuzzy, or it's like, when you, also when you record audio, like, keep, keep, a, keep repeating it, like, play it back to hear it with the, head, yeah. with the headphones on. If you catch any, like, puffs, or, um, like, whenever you use, like, a B or a P word or something, it'll kind of puff extra air out into the microphone, and you'll, it'll, like, sound really funny when it does that. It'll kind of be a sound that's really loud, and it kind of is distracting. You kind of want to make it sound like you're hearing it from the character's voice, not in front of you. Know, like they have a mic on them or something. Yeah. So, um, be sure to, like, you might want to re-record those lines until you've got some clear audio yeah. that's not too distracting. As far as like just the material for us good goes, um, that's really up to you. Uh, we can tell you that it's it usually helps to think about what works with the anime, like what goes with the story, but doesn't Judges necessarily. Really like something that's pretty true to the series, but if you're doing a comedy skit, you know that's kind of like crossovers work. You know those. Uh, make, you can make jokes, cultural reference jokes. You know, as long as it's part there's of the so game. many ways you can go. You can go like comedy, dramatic, a mix of both, We've done action. Um, there's some people who are really good with choreography. They like to do dancing or action skits. Um, now, as far as dancing goes, um, if it's a dance that already exists, generally it's not as impressive. And if it's something a lot of people do, it gets overdone. I mean, I've seen some people do more of like J-pop dances, and it's a little more unique because more people are kind of doing different dances. And so it's yeah. not like seeing, but like if you're doing either uh, like the Haruhi Suzumiya or Carmel Donson on stage, I mean, a lot of people see that, and usually it's, it's, it's gotten to the point where sometimes it's done too much, and a lot of people are like, oh, no, not another one of those. Yeah, which is sad because, I mean, you obviously like it if you're doing it, so we're not trying to... Yeah. Steer you away from it. It's just you might if, something to consider is that not to, everybody's going to appreciate it. So. And also sometimes, uh, as far as dancing skit goes, um, usually more uh, contests are trying to narrow down the time limit because they don't want a lot of people dancing on stage for like five or seven minutes. Yeah, it gets hard um, to, to keep up with. I mean, it's, if, it'll if you're be, sitting here and we're dancing the whole time, it, it sometimes doesn't keep the audience attention the whole time. It'll be entertaining to watch to some people, but some people. Like they're very ADD. You yeah. Know? They like to see. Or, you With know. the skit, they're they're expecting um, dialogue, interaction, stuff. You know, changes in plot. And with I've the dance, seen, there's really no plot. It's just an art form. I've so seen it, some it may really or may good dance and skits so that like. Yeah, there's um, there've been some good dance and skits that didn't even have any audio. It was just like a kind of like a ballet or something, um, and they worked really well. It's, it's something that you have to practice. And Their what choreography I've was kind of based on, like for example, we saw this. One of my favorite skits I've ever seen was a. Uh, it was a. It was actually a Death Note dancing skit, and it was it was a, a light cosplayer and a Misa cosplayer. And, and basically, their story through dance was that he was showing how he was kind of controlling her, like he was the puppeteer, she was the puppet. Basically, and, and it was really well choreographed. It, it looked like she was on string, basically. When she was. It was and, a very beautiful skit. Yeah, but they, they did. But you could tell that they practiced it. Ridiculous. And they did their own. It was they did their own choreography too. Yeah. Their story. Um, it's a bit harder to do if you don't have dance experience. But there's well, dancing or not. What I would recommend if you're doing a skit is after you've gotten it, after you've gotten your ideas figured out, before you go past the script, I would have it proofread and checked by like some friends, see what they think of the skit idea. If they like it, then that's probably, you know, get four or five different friends in from anime to see if they if they could understand it. Get people who don't know what it's like, don't know the series to, to read it. If they can still enjoy it, even if they've never seen the show before, then you've got a good skit. Because you have to understand that not every you like not everyone's seen like Final Fantasy, Crisis Core, not everybody's seen Kingdom Hearts, like if we did a skip from that, then we'd have to still cater to those people who haven't seen it. Otherwise, they're not going to care. Um, so, like, it, it helps to, like, to, to talk to people who you know who like anime, or so that they'll appreciate it as a skit, but who haven't necessarily played the game or seen the show, so that you can get that outside opinion. 
because then you know, okay, they're an outsider, they're representing the masses of people who haven't seen this, who don't know the story, and does it still work, or are they left in the dark, or are they completely confused? You know, because that's tough. Because some people will do skits, and it's very specific to material in the show. They may think oh, that doesn't make isn't... any sense to anybody who hasn't seen it. They may think, oh, this will make sense, but it doesn't always. It does. We've had, yeah. we've done that before. We've done a skit, and someone didn't really quite understand the jokes yeah. that we were doing. And it's just like, well, we thought they would be funny, even if it's not. You know, they don't see it, but that wasn't the case. They were serious. Yeah, and you know, if if you're holding the majority of the crowd, I guess that's okay. But you know, it. It helps to try to consider the whole populace because um, you may or may not have a majority, and the better your better odds are to you know, think to, to take that into consideration so that you can plan for it and plan a skit that does cover the majority or at least can kind of work for the people who haven't seen it. Same thing applies also to really popular like jokes that you find on the internet that are kind of uh, like. Or even not internet jokes, but like jokes from other games, like, you know, the cake is a lie, or just different memes, things like that. Yeah. Not everyone knows those, just... even though it's kind of like a general common knowledge sort of thing, but... Yeah, and some of them are, again, kind of independent. Um, when it comes to comedy skits, you kind of want to think about humor that relates to more, like, to the game itself, or the, you know, instead of trying to throw in a bunch of cultural references, I mean, you can't go that route. But just make sure that you're still creative enough that it's your skit and not just a mash, a hash of a bunch of things. You know, usually people are more impressed, uh, impressed by the originality that you can bring to the audience. So once you got your ideas in, in, in check and you've you know talked to some people and you think that you got a good thing going, um, get the audio recorded. Uh, that's usually the next step to do. So make that sure. way that you get the. You might record you record the audio, read it out loud to yourself, and make sure and kind of time it and see that you're in the time limit. Well, yeah, I was going to say between the two, one or the other, figure out, make sure that the time limit is met, so that you're not in trouble and you're not cutting parts of the script out. That happened with some friends of ours in Texas uh, last year for a skit we did help them out with, and like they had to chop like three or four minutes of audio. There was a lot of jokes that they had to cut out. Like, yeah, and it's two. and their quality suffered a lot from it. Like it, they still, we still won a prize and stuff, but it, it wasn't nearly. It was still a good skit, but it would have been better. If we it would have been so much more amazing if, if they would have had the whole time. So like, and that's a tragedy, you know. And like, they didn't realize that until we'd already recorded all of the audio. So like, I had done one of the voices, and I'd done like twenty different lines, and they ended up chopping my lines down to like five. They wasted a whole bunch of my time, and I, got, I don't blame them for it because I'm a friend, but, you know, it sucks. I, I was really disappointed because there were so many lines that I got attached to. I was like, I thought the script was so awesome. And then they were like, oh, shoot, we, we have to cut all this off because we don't, we're not making time. So, yeah, I, I actually would say read it, read it off before you record it, but, you know, figure out what the timeline is, make sure that you're meeting that timeline and that the script is not going over. Um, and also, well, um, when you're when you're reading it off, kind of picture any um, non-audio cues that require time for them, like because you're not gonna just be. Ah, wait, wait, is it, is Am I not loud enough? Maybe you're not loud enough. I'm, there's just I'm a lot of loud. The loud the screen. I don't know. I can project. I don't know about Melinda, but I can project pretty well. Can you hear me in the back? I can hear you guys fine. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, they're going crazy over there, aren't they? I don't know what they're doing. I think, the ramen I think it might be the Jeopardy thing. Jeopardy thing? Ramen, ramen, ramen thing? Ramen, ramen. ramen Jeopardy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. While you're re while you're reading off the script or recording, while you're figuring out the time frame for the skit, uh, keep in mind the actions that people do, because it's it's one thing for you to have all all the audio combined to make the time limit, but that's not going to look natural if, if they're just like going back and forth without any breaks in between what you're saying, and breaks for, for movements, or walking across the stage, like say, you say something and you're supposed to move over here before you say another thing, 
that takes time too. Or if there's certain actions that may be triggered, but you need time to have those actions. Yeah, or say you've got out. a fight scene and you're not talking during a fight scene. Don't forget those kinds of things, because that all stacks up to the time limit total. Though you can save time and make it more interesting by trying to, you know, do your actions while you're, you know, talking. Because yeah. you can, like, I don't know how to describe it. Like if you're, uh, say you're talking while you're walking. Or say say something right as if you're about to question person. I don't know. It it combines well, but that, that's more of a practice thing than either way. Just make sure that it, that that you keep in mind the time limit with all things. Make sure that the audio flows naturally. I kind of like to think about like when you're trying to plan a skit, even kind of take what time limit you're allowed and maybe chop off either a minute or a half of what the time limit is and kind of plan a skit that can fit in that time. Yeah, so that way, if you go a little over, you're still not hitting the real time limit. You've got a little bit of leeway between what your skit is going to be and what the ultimate the timeline is, uh, time limit is. Um, but yeah, you probably realize that between all of these things, it does take a long time, which is why we really suggest start early, start months in advance. Even if you don't think it'll take months, it just means that it'll be done that much sooner and you, you won't have to worry about it. We had skits that we would write the script for like, you know, weeks before the convention, and then by the time we got all the audio recorded, it was like a few days we left. Yeah. There are some people in the group who had not even heard the audio until at the convention. So if there was any lip syncing that they wanted to do, I mean, lip syncing isn't such a huge deal because there's usually people so far away that they can't tell. You know, as long as the character is, that's another thing. Whenever you're on stage and you're talking as a character, don't just, you know, don't stand, stand and lip don't sync. Stand like a pole. Gesture a lot because Gesture. there's going to be a lot of people who don't know who's talking because they can't tell who's lip syncing to it. And it's also more interesting to watch. Yeah. Okay, so, so you got the audio recorded, and you got your time figured out, you get to the choreography part. Um, it should be something that you had basic ideas for beforehand, but like, um, say that you don't. Um, try to figure out uh, placements for people in the skits so that they aren't blocking each other. And that can be tough to do because the audience spans a long distance. So like, people over here, like, yeah, yeah, say I'm in front, like, I'm blocking them, like, okay. If I'm even right here. If I'm here. in front of her, obviously, most people aren't going to see her. But even if I'm right here, the people over there aren't going to see me. Exactly. So, it, it helps to have a little bit of space between them, and it still looks natural. Um, kind of cheat, uh, cheat the angles that you look at each other sometimes. Because um, if I'm turned, if my back's turned to you, this is kind of awkward. Because I'm talking to her, but I'm not, but you're not. You know, getting what I'm doing, right? Kind of facing towards space the space towards the audience so that you're talking to each other. Um, and when you're practicing all these movements, if possible, see if you can find out from the convention people what the dimensions of the stage are, so you know exactly how much space you have. You want to utilize that space. Yeah, utilize majority. that space. Don't be afraid of being stuck in this little box and talking with each other like the whole skit when you've got like 50 people to work with. Um, I mean, obviously you have these kind of interactions in your skit, but you can also have actions where you're basically walking across the stage and okay. making a much larger scene out of it, you know, expanding the horizon. Um, once you've figured out the choreography, um, like there's a lot more to choreography than what we can really cover in just this small thing, but um, look, at, look at what other people have done with skits. Look at what people do in theater. Think of different ways that you can reference and practice. There are so many tutorials on YouTube and other websites that tell you how to do choreography for like dances, for fighting, for just simple interactions, to basic acting. If you have the option to take acting classes, definitely do it, because that helps with skits, and that helps with performance. It even helps with just basic interactions as a cosplayer. You know, it's, it's really eye-opening. But if you don't have class, then again, the tutorial's online. There's lots of options out there. Online is ridiculous. You know, you can just about find anything that you need. Something that I learned it. from other people was you want to make something that gets the audience wanting more. Yeah. You know, it don't like you I could like, uh, like whether it be leaving the audience just laughing, dying on the floor. You know, with with, a, with like a big punchline at the end of the, of the comedy skit. 
or even just a dramatic skit that tells a story and then kind of makes them curious what, what, what like, you know, what's going on. Oh, I, I really want to know what happens, you know. You could tell part of the story, but not the whole thing. But yeah. still, you know, you want to make it happen. We had, we had some friends who uh, did a skit for Howl's Moving Castle, and what they did was they basically made an introduction to the movie. They, they did, like, these small bits and pieces that weren't in the movie, but could have led up to the movie, like, like the prince, like if you haven't seen the movie, it's like a prince who's a scarecrow, like a little, little turn head. And they, they told the story of how turn head turned into the scarecrow. And like showed a little bit of how doing magic with his apprentice and uh, you know, a little bit of Sophie. It was really great. It, it flowed perfectly with the movie. Like it felt like it belonged. And it, I wouldn't be surprised if we got a lot of people wanting to watch the movie afterwards, whether they'd seen it or not. Because, you know, it whets your appetite for that sort of thing. But it was really well done. Also, um, well, don't be afraid to utilize your talents that you have, whether it be like, we, I've seen people who've done hula hoops, I've yeah. seen people who do things with yo-yos. I've seen people play the ukulele or the violin on stage, you know, if you know I've seen people do, do ballet for Princess Tutu. Absolutely. I mean, there, there are so many options. You could, you could do like a mime. <laughs> it's a talent show as much as it is a performance, you know? But And people love that stuff. The, the more out of the ordinary it is, sometimes that's amazing because people don't expect it and then they appreciate it because it's, you know, it's something new. There is a group uh, one year that convention we went to that did, they did a skit about cosplay, like the making of a costume. Yeah, and yeah. Then they like uh, made, they had a costume, at, like a finished costume at the end that they were able to kind of slap on. It was like, yeah, you know, it was they, kind of a musical of sorts. Yeah. Um, you know, they, did the lyrics themselves. And yeah, they had like, they're making it on the dress form and everything. And they kind of zipped through it, so it was, you know, it was a music video. It was really cool. Really. You know? um, that does bring up another important but not mandatory factor is props and backgrounds, you know, the, the parts of the skit that provide more visual. They're not mandatory, you know, you don't Honestly, have to Honestly, if it skit. isn't really necessary, don't worry about it. Do yeah. the essentials, what is necessary? I mean, it's really nice to have the icing on the cake background that's right, really pretty right. well drawn, but like... Those are all time consumption things, and that's really up to you. Like, if you've got a year to plan for a skit, then go all out. Figure out what the background's gonna be, paint a mural you know, or whatever. You usually don't want something that's not, overpower yeah. what you're trying to present to the audience as far as, like, what you're acting, you know. Figure out what works, you know. But the bare essentials are obviously just you, you yourself, the actors. Um, a backdrop, even just a simple white or black backdrop, never hurts because it puts perspective of what's there. Like it, it paints a picture of okay, there's a room here. Like our, our uh, same group of friends from Texas. Usually they'll make like a backdrop that's very simple, but they make a couple of moving backdrops so that they can make walls here, doors there. You know, very That's simple. The stage, though. Right. It's, it's not, it wasn't too complex. Like, we did it, we were in a skit that they had a jail cell. They wanted to make sure it looked like a jail cell. So they made, well, they made like, Some tape dogs. bars, you know, <laughs> to, to make, like, a prison door. And that was about it. You know, and some, some chairs. Very simple, but it really helped because it brought you into the, into the place, you know. It, it made you realize, oh, this is a jail. So that you, you don't have to imagine it as much. But, um... It doesn't have to be elaborate either, like you're saying. Like you don't have to make a boulder that looks like you plucked a boulder out of the desert. We had friends that made a bush, and it was just like a giant green cardboard cutout, and it said bush. It said bush. On it. Bush on but it. It was, People loved it, it was, but it was they a got the idea. Stuff. It's a bush. You know. <laughs> it was <laughs> it more of a comedy purpose. Exactly, but, it but you know, it's there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. You can go for realism, you can go for simplicity, but usually simplicity is pretty good because they get the idea, but they still appreciate it for the, that extra bit that it provides. If you're doing props, it's supposed to be an important part of the skit, plot, or something. Yeah, sort. make, sure, make that, sure it's big enough that the audience can see it. Yeah. Take um, your time with it. Make sure that it's the way you want it to be. Um, pretty much always got to take time for these things. The, the more time that you have to work on these things, the better the quality will be. Um, if you do it all in a week, it might fall apart. You know, people might not get the story. They might off the stage but if you just want to do something goofy last minute it never hurts it's, it's really up to you if but 
from our experience, the longer you take with it, the better it's going to be. Yeah, it'll turn out the way you want it. Even if the audience doesn't get the same out of it that you put into it, at least you will be satisfied that you put forth the effort that you meant to. I don't know. I'm going to talk to you. Something I do want to tell people, though, as far as, you know, when it comes to competing in competitions, be a good sport. Be Just good because sport. you don't get something doesn't mean the judges didn't like it. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that, that it doesn't you mean that you, you know. Try, try again. And always work for improvement. Always oh, be excited to do your thing. Like, um, those, those friends of ours from Texas, they almost always win the skits contest, but we still get a lot of, of good shows there. And I think a lot of people maybe compete just to try to beat them, but at least they're putting forth the effort to do what they want to do. And we're actually going to be competing with those friends this uh, fall, and we're crossing our fingers that we might beat them. But either way, we're, we're yeah. mostly doing more, it because more of the more importantly, you want to, you want, it's the more, it's really satisfying to be able to present something that the audience can really just appreciate. Fellow fans of what you're doing can appreciate. Right. And honest, that's the biggest reward is to have someone come up and say, I'm such a huge fan of this show and I really think you guys did it justice. Yeah, you it's know. it's kind of a heartwarming thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the same reason, same thing with costumes in general. You make a costume because you love the character and you want to share your love with everyone else who potentially loves it as well. Like, there's nothing more satisfying to have someone walk up to you and tell you that you nailed the character, that you popped out of the book and became real, you know, and it's the same with skits, when you're coming up with an idea and you feel like like you're portraying a part of that show or making it your own and still tying it into the continuum of, of you know, your fandom, you know, make it, you know, it, it's really satisfying to have that end result be accepted by everyone, so, it, you know, it does take time to figure out, but when it all comes together, it's pretty awesome. Any more questions before we wrap it up? All right. I think that's Thank it for us then. If you, if you do come up with any other questions and you see us later, feel free to walk up to us, ask us. We're very social. We want to help out in any way that we can. Um, we have websites on DeviantArt. Uh, ex-shadow.deviantart.com If you go to the website, the guests, the guests where our links to our websites are on there. Yeah, so. it's on the website for this convention. There's a link to our stuff. Yes. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search for Kyle and Melinda or EX Shadow and Melinda Chan. Um, and again, just ask us anything. We're always willing to help. Thanks for coming, and see you around. <laughs>